<laughs> Hi everyone, I'm just uh, just getting started here. I'm sorry, I'm always a few minutes late. I apologize, but thanks everyone that's here already. I really appreciate that. Let's see who's who's in today. I love talking to you guys. This is uh, honestly the the live streams are the highlights of my week when I go come in on Thursday and Sunday and. We get to kind of talk about photography and, and Olympus and, and just what's been going on, you know. And uh, you guys also really have a lot of good uh, um, uh, experience that you can share with, with others here in the, in the chat section, which, you know, over here I appreciate. But uh, let's, see, let's see who comes in today. Maybe <laughs> uh, usually Sunday it seems like Robin and uh, Maddie come in. But, you know, I reach out to any creator, you know, if you want to come into my live stream in the chat room or maybe I can pull you in through Skype and we can do a dual live stream. You're always welcome to do that. Or even some of you, my viewers here, you guys have a lot of experience that you can share. And I'm sure, uh, you know, it'd be uh, a real privilege and honor for a lot of us to have you on as well. Um, anyhow, <clears throat> a couple updates. I mean, a lot. I don't know how many of you are here on the Thursday live stream, but I talked about a couple of things. So I'll just go over them quickly. Um, one is I got I got this new camera from Larry Hayes. He's uh, one of my viewers here. He sent me a, a long-term loan on this, but I'm going I'm to buy this off him here probably by the end of the month. But it's a GW693 or Mark III you know, six by nine medium format film cameras. So I'm really excited to start getting some shots. I took a couple of shots of my dog with it. Um, are you guys getting sound? Because Ronald's saying there's no sound. Good morning, Leon. Oh, hey, first time here, huh? Awesome, glad you could join. Is Is there sound? Okay, good, good. All right. Sorry, Ronald. I'm not sure why there's no sound. Maybe there's something on your end you need to click. Uh, is the sound okay? Am I loud enough? Because I, uh, I changed my setup just slightly today uh, so that there's a little wider view so you can see, see my hands a little more. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, it, is, it is huge. And I've... Uh, so I didn't realize on my past streams I had it cropped in so much. Um, I think I did that because I didn't want this mic to be in the shot, but yeah, who cares, right? <laughs> um, as long as you guys can hear me. Because I've been watching other live streams and, uh, you know, they're using pretty elaborate setups, but the sound is not that good. I was kind of surprised on some of them. But when I... I don't know how it is live, but when I play back, uh... <laughs> oh, Rick, you have a hurricane going on. I have a little space heater in the background that's going to kick off in a few minutes, or uh, well, within the hour, because um, it's cold in my house. I uh, I try not to turn on the heat unless it's uh, I don't know, just. Oil is so I have an old oil furnace that's like 50 years old, so I tr I try to use it as little as possible, <laughs> keep the maintenance down and and fuel oil costs down. And the electric bill is is pretty nominal because only well anyway, who cares about that? Uh, <laughs> okay, Christian, I'm. <laughs> I'm glad. I, I don't know sign language, but uh, I'm glad you can follow along and join us. I appreciate that. And it's it's amazing how many uh, countries actually watch my channel. I, I guess Olympus has a little bigger presence than other countries. Uh, what was the other thing? Um, lens tag was something I talked about on Thursday that if you weren't here for that, uh, it's a pretty interesting app that you can get on Apple and on Android. And you put your camera serial number and everything, and they keep a database of, uh, you know, cameras. 
so that if you ever think about buying a camera or <clears throat> you your camera gets stolen you can search the database uh, to see if a camera you bought may have been stolen or you can or others can search the database and see if they got your camera maybe they bought it off eBay you know and they found you on lens tag or they reported it I, I don't know it you know if you find a stolen camera on eBay I think on eBay that it's probably best to just maybe buy it and I don't know I don't know what to do what, what would you guys do if you see a camera on eBay that you know is stolen <laughs> uh, I'm sure eBay has some policy for that that you can but it uh, you know what what are the uh, I don't know I don't know what to do um, anyhow I, I widened up my, my angle of view uh, <clears throat> on this live stream, Rick, so I can, I can, I can use my hands more. I, I didn't realize I was such a, like, hands talker, you know, until I really started doing these live streams, because I would do my, my videos, and it just, you know, you have to use your hands to demonstrate things, but then when I'm just sitting here jibber-jabbering about gear... Uh, God, my hands are all over the place. But that's good. I like it. Um, hey, Andreas, how are you? So, gosh, a lot of the uh, regulars are here today. I appreciate that. Uh, so, anyway, Lens Tag is a, is a really good software. Uh, it, it's a little awkward for me, but I'm not really an app person with a cell phone. Just... <clears throat> You know, I used to use a BlackBerry that had real physical keys, keys on it many years ago, and then it's just unavoidable. You know, everything is like this now. Uh, if you want to get anything done or use anything cool or integrate with your house <laughs> or your camera, <laughs> um, it's, it's just the way things are now, unfortunately. I try not to use the app if I can. The only, the only thing the app is really good for, in my opinion, or for me, I should say, is to synchronize the, the clocks on all my cameras because uh, when I'm importing images or recording video, I can sync up everything a lot easier when I see the timestamps are all the same. Uh, <clears throat> Hi, Magrat. How are you? <laughs> um, it's still pretty tight shot, isn't it? Yeah, that's because I, I, I sit up towards the mic. But this, this is like my normal... Let me adjust this a little bit. Maybe maybe move it over. This is like my normal position. But then I'm not that close to the mic. <clears throat> um, so those, those were the two things I opened up with on Thursday. was the lens tag software and this, this GW6, 690 that, that Larry sent me. And... Just to give you some perspective, God, this thing is huge. <laughs> but just to give you some perspective, this is my EM5 Mark III, kind of next to it. <laughs> um, no comparison. And th this is a fully manual camera. It has no light meter. So I've taken two shots with it, and I, I'm pretty sure I overexposed them. But uh, I'll take one picture with this camera, then I'll set the settings on this with the same settings and that that's worked for me on my my uh om1 35 millimeter camera but what's funny is i i took a took two shots with this camera because you only get about eight shots per roll of film uh man it sounds like a mouse trap going off i mean the shutter is so large inside it's just clang you know <laughs> it's kind of funny uh, so it's not going to be discreet at all. Um, and, and you know, the body, they made it out of virtually all plastic. Oh, my God, there's only 80 shots on this. This actually has a shutter counter on it, too. Um, <laughs> my God, this thing is, like, brand new. That's only, like, 10 rolls of film. Um, <laughs> what crosshairs, Rick? 
Oh. So I think Yuhan saying, you watched all my videos and you learned a lot. Thanks. Oh, you're welcome, Yuhan. I'm glad to help. Um, I have so many videos on the M10 Mark II and a lot of the overlaps to the Pen F and the M5 Mark III or Mark II. But someone said they were watching my EM5 Mark III videos and it helped them a lot with their EM10 Mark II. So that's nice. I'm not sure where to go next with my EM53 videos. If I should continue that in the menu system uh, or go into the super control panel or talk about the exterior and the buttons. I think I just, I don't know, whatever I'm feeling for the day. Every, you know, all my videos, they're very unscripted. You know, I just kind of, I kind of, I find a window of time that I can sit down and make them. And then I said, okay, what should I, what I feel like doing today? And then I just sit down and start recording. I mean, there's a lot of prep uh, to, oh, hey, Leon, sorry. There's really no theme today. I just. Normally, I like to answer questions from any viewers and uh, and just talk about what's been going on and some things that uh, that yeah mainly what's what's been going on with me this week and then you know photography related uh, but I just like hanging out with you guys basically. <clears throat> um, but yeah, so everything is pretty much unscripted on my on my tutorials and the the setup and prep because I did one tutorial, my first EM5 Mark III tutorial. I just sat here at my desk and I, you know, I didn't like that one at all. I mean, the content was okay, meaning it it I got the message across that I wanted to get across. So I made a second one where I sat over in my desk that's just behind me or at a table and that went a little better but I think my third one you guys should see some improvement in the overall production value okay so let's talk about content creation or creation from zero okay um, and I was reading yeah I do I do want to talk about that and I'll share with you guys a couple of thoughts on that uh, so Mike is saying, I don't know how Olympus used market is in the U.S., but it's not very good here in Canada. I sold nearly new EM10 Mark II in a 12 to 50 lens and couldn't get more than half. Wow. And then Richard says, hi, Rob, all the best from Germany or, or from Wales. I'm sorry. <clears throat> you got God's country next to it. It looked like, because I don't have my glasses, it looks like Germany from here. Um... Krishna says, I would need to get a Pen F, Ali Mark III, and Ali Mark M1 Mark II, but in my country, it's very expensive. Penny and Sony are very economical. It's probably just uh, volume, right? Supply and demand. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. I am feeling a little better. Actually, the lighting's a little bit strong, and I feel I feel like I'm a little pasty looking in the video. Maybe I'll just tone the, the uh, brightness down just a third of a stop. That did nothing. <laughs> Ooh, too much. <laughs> All right, close enough. Um, <clears throat> Hi, Rob. My Blue Hour photos with the OMD Mark II. Or oh, you want to try Blue Hour photos. Have you any advice about exposure? The shot across a marina to be lighted restaurant. Um, really, all the Blue Hour shots I've ever taken, I just used the matrix metering or the, I forget what Olympus calls it. And the camera did fine. You know, generally when I when I take a shot, I concentrate mostly on exposing for the subject uh, and then let everything else fall where they may. And, you know, Blue Hour, 
I've never had any issue. The blue is always like this deep, rich blue, regardless of what my concentration is on the subject matter. So probably, you know, just take two or three shots, uh, concentrating on your subject and see how the blue hour comes. And then you can kind of do some exposure uh, adjustments like the, the uh, exposure compensation uh, plus or minus, depending on how you want the sky to look relative to your subject matter. Apparently the M13 will have a joystick. What are your thoughts on this old tech? <laughs> uh, I'm not a fan of the joystick on my Fuji film. Uh, I have a Fuji X-T30. That's because I've been using the D-pad for so long that I'm just used to that. And the, and the, the, the joystick to me feels kind of... I don't know. I don't feel like I have any precision with it. Like I can't like, if I want to go in one direction very quickly, yeah, it's kind of good. But then usually when I'm focusing, I prefer a little precision and being able to just click over one, two, three, over to the left and one up or two up so I can get the upper left thirds to me is, is it's easier for me. Um, but it looks like the, from the pictures I saw in the M1 Mark three, it has both, um, uh, the the joystick and the D-pad, so I think that that will be good. Um, I mean, that'll be good if I decide to get that camera. I'm still not sure yet. I'm waiting for it to come out because the rumors in of themselves don't uh, don't show me anything that I don't already have uh, for me to spend you know, another $2,000, in other words. I mean, if it was like a $1,000 camera, I might consider it, but... Um, yeah, Hanson, I, I don't I don't get... Hanson, uh, Tor, Tor Gear is saying he doesn't uh, understand the fascination with joysticks. I, I don't either, I don't... But that, that, like I said, that's because I've always used a D-pad. If if I had the muscle memory for a joystick, it, I might prefer it over a D-pad. But I don't. I, I'm I'm really good with a D-pad. Uh, hi Ray, how are you? He's asking, have I tried the Pana eight to eighteen? No, I have not. I have not tried it. That one millimeter, though, is, it's not a big deal for the average photographer going from eight millimeter to nine millimeter. Uh, if, you're, if you're doing work professionally, though, that one millimeter can be a big deal. Because, like, when I do my real estate photography, one millimeter is a, is a big difference in a room, uh, particularly small rooms. But for landscapes and things like that, you know, one millimeter is not that much difference. But it just depends how picky you are, right? I guess about your field of view. But in, in small spaces, it can be a big deal because you don't have a lot of room to move around. And that extra one millimeter can, can, can really help. You know, because on micro four thirds, you know, the sensors, it's cropped. So it, it makes a little bigger impact. Um... Rick is saying they might add some games to the to the menu on the M1 Mark III. I hope not. That, that'll, you know, you'll sit there and play games and then you'll drain your battery and then when you're ready to take a picture, you know, it's <laughs> your battery's dead. Kent's saying, in addition to using a tripod, are there any settings on my pen app that I need to change before I take a high-res photo? Uh, no, not really. Um... Just just check your exposure and use use a uh, really good uh, lens, the sharpest lens you you have in your bag if you're going to do a high res. Because personally, I haven't found high res to be, you know, like double the resolution. You know, when I put my very best lenses on, I might get about twenty thirty percent better resolution, and 
and that's at close distances like product photography or macro photography. For landscape photography, that high res, you know, all of it's wasted in atmosphere and you're not going to see much difference. And you, you may have seen my video on my high res mode uh, comparisons. Uh, you can check that out if, you know, to me, it's just not worth it. I, I don't I don't care for high res personally uh, because of the workflow. You, you have to have a tripod and you have to, you know, have really sharp lenses and then just a lot of overhead just to get a little bit more resolution. Uh, I mean, like I said, it makes sense for very specific applications, maybe macro and product, but overall I'm not a big fan. But I'm, I'm working on a macro, and I, I do want to talk about this, uh, a macro photography video. Because Peter just did a couple, so he kind of beat me to the punch, but I, I was working on it. Because I lost my extension tubes, so I was waiting for those to come in. They came in, and I ordered a different brand this time uh, because I liked the button on it a little better. And it does have a little better uh, button on it than the Mikey ones I had before. But these extension tubes, for some reason, only work on certain cameras. When I put this on my EM5 Mark III or my EM1 Mark II or my EM5 Mark II, the extension tubes don't work, meaning the, it, the camera acts like there's no lens on it. But then on every other camera I have, my Pen F, my EM10, my Pen PL8, uh, I'm not having any problems. So I don't, I don't know what's changed. Uh, I mean, obviously these pins are not contacting uh, the the pins on the camera or this uh, the locking pin here is not deep enough so the camera is not seeing the, the uh, lens attached so I'll have to I have to diagnose that a bit so if you have if you have a camera what brand are these these are oh they didn't even put the brand on here I was gonna I was gonna say don't buy these until I figure out what's going on. Let me just uh let me look at my Amazon order page. So I'm gonna tell you what extension tubes not to buy. Where are my orders? Yeah, this one here. Um, Fotka brand. These are these are not working with with uh, some of my cameras. It works great with others, but some of them they do not. I bought these because they were five dollars cheaper than the Mikey ones I was going to order. Uh, so there you have it. Um, Oops, now I lost my place here. Oh, here we are. Okay. Um, so, Ken, you're going to try the high-res with the 12-millimeter prime. Yeah, that's a that's a very sharp lens. If you're going to use a lens, that's a good one to, to try the high-res shot mode. Uh, just make sure it's, you know, not, not a humid day and it's, you know, there's as little haze as possible. Use a lens hood, uh, you know, to reduce any kind of flaring. So the best, you know, just do the best you can and see what see what happens. Let me know next week when I if you come into the live stream. Uh, hi Rob from Windy Brittany. Do you have an opinion about the Fuji X100V and do you think Olympus should engage in this market? Um, I I only watched one video earlier this week on the X100V because I'm not interested in that camera, but I guess they took. You know, basically, the, it, they're just updating it like the X-T30. They're just putting everything in from the X-T30 into an X100V with a fixed lens. Uh, I like the fact that they improved the the, folk, the uh, sharpness of the lens at close distances because I had the X100F, and I, I got rid of it and got an X-T30. Uh, but 
if it's basically the same thing as my XT30, otherwise, you know, other than the form factor, I, I'm not that excited about it. That's a camera that's for people that already love Fuji and the handling and all the ergonomics of a Fuji, but in a compact form. Uh, it's kind of like the Pen F, right? The Pen F doesn't offer anything particularly uh, image quality wise different than any other Olympus camera, but you buy it because you just, you know, you just love it, right? Like, I just love this camera. And I think the X100V is kind of in the same boat. You kind of got to, you know, like Fuji to buy something like that. And it's $1,400. Uh, you know, it just amazes me that everybody gives Olympus flack for being expensive. And then other companies come out with a $1,400 camera and nobody says Jack. You know, they're like, this is a great camera. <laughs> Any thoughts on the 8 to 24 for which Ali has filed a patent? It seems like Ali is planning a set of F4 lenses. I think the F4s are great lenses for people that are new to the system and getting into Olympus for the first time. You know, having a fixed aperture and having a new selection of lenses at, you know, slightly different focal lengths. Like 8 to 24 is very. Um, it's a very handy range. But for people that have already invested in a lot of Olympus glass, like I am, none of these lenses really appeal to me uh, over what I already have. So other than if they're weather sealed, maybe that could be something. But I'm not, I'm not really a go into the environment, messy environment kind of photographer. So weather sealing is not a big deal for me. So I, you know, hopefully they're, they're going to be tack sharp as, you know, all Olympus glasses has always been. And I think they're great lenses for people getting into Micro Four Thirds and into Olympus in particular. Uh, but as a, as a current owner of so much glass, there, I haven't seen anything that excited me because F4 is not that fast. You know, it's not prime fast anyway. And, uh, the lenses I have, I, like I said, I have most of those focal lengths covered. I might consider an 8 to 24, though, over the 9 to 18 that Olympus currently offers. Because I've been eyeballing the 9 to 18 because of a small, compact, and nice wide angle. It would be a perfect vlogging street camera. So the 8 to 24 looks, looks attractive for, like, street photography and vlogging if you want to, you know, for me. And put that on the M5 Mark III, and you have like the ultimate camera. And F4 is just fast enough to kind of get away with even vlogging at night uh, with the Mark III. Uh, Leon's asked, any thoughts if the new Fuji models aimed at travel photography have advantages over the EM5 II or Pan F for travel? Uh, any thoughts on the new Fuji models? I assume you mean new like the X-T30 and the X-100V, they don't really have any advantages. I mean, they're, they're, they're fine cameras, but I, you know, they're, they're very different, right? Fuji's a little bit larger system with the APS-C sensor and the ergonomics are very different. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of the ergonomics, despite, you know, everybody bragging on how the dials are on it. They're, they're not actually that functional for the way I shoot. Now, if you're a full manual photographer, you shoot full manual all the time. Uh, having the dials the way they're laid out on the Fuji now are actually pretty good for that, right? They're very similar to full manual film cameras because you have a shutter speed dial, exposure to comp dial, um, and then an ISO dial, etc. And then the aperture is right on the, on the lens. But for aperture priority shooters, shutter priority shooters, program mode shooters, the dials are pretty, uh, uh, they're just wasted real estate. Um, yeah, Plato had the X100T and sold it. Yeah, it just didn't work for me. The, the lack of a tilt screen, I don't know if the V has a tilt screen or not, but the lack of a tilt screen for street photography was a big hindrance on the, the X100F that I had.
Uh, Togear is asking if the Vogue cover is 8 megapixels. I, I don't know if anybody knows what magazine covers are. <laughs> When I bring my EM5 Mark III or Pentax K1 to the photo club, people ask from what planet I've just landed. <laughs> Pentax is awesome. And obviously Olympus is awesome. I just watched the video this morning from uh, Kai. And, uh, you know, he, it was about how he switched the Pentax. And he had the ugliest Pentax ever made. That Pentax KP. <laughs> Uh, but he made a comment in the video about nobody buys Olympus, full stop, was this, was a quote from that video. And I was like, why? Why? Why don't people buy Olympus? They're, they're amazing cameras. And I don't know how true or false that is. I mean, I saw a s quarterly statement on uh, 43 Rumors that they're losing less money or generating more revenue. I didn't look at it that closely because it doesn't, you know, I'll have to go back to it when I have some more time, but uh, what's wrong with the 2.8 Pros? Nothing's wrong with those. They're great lenses. I guess you mean in relation to the new F4s coming out. The only thing wrong with the 2.8 Pros is they're kind of big and heavy relative to everything else in Micro Four Thirds. Uh, although I'll give Panasonic some credit, their f2.8 lenses are are relatively compact. The well, the what is it? The 12 to what do they got? A 12 to 35 or 12 to 40 compact 2.8, and then their 35 to 100 f2.8. I I kind of like the size of those over say the 40 to 150 Pro, but I think. The extra reach with the 40 to 150 Pro makes it worth the, the carry. Ray saying that's the part I'm bothered about as I'm getting into M43 and was planning to get to 918, but not sure if it would be wasted after the 8 to 24 comes out. Yeah, I'm gonna wait for the 8 to 24 now. Now that I, now that I know it's coming. Uh, good morning, Larry. How are you? I, I took I was I don't know if you were here earlier. I took a couple of shots of my dog with the camera. I think I overexposed them. Uh but we'll see. I haven't developed it yet. But today's supposed to be a nice day, but then I have to go meet a client today. So I don't know if I have time to take it out and and shoot with it. Because tomorrow and Tuesday's supposed to rain. I'm a little bit stressed. I really want to take it out and, and kill that roll off, get it developed, and do a vlog on it. Uh, John Matthews is saying there's no pancake lens for the Fujis. That, yeah, but that's almost true across every brand. There's not a ton of pancake lenses like off the shelf. You have to kind of dig to find them. Um, at least with Panasonic, they have a couple and Olympus had a couple, but they're not, yeah, they're not as popular as, as you would as, as much as I would want them to be. I would love a pancake 75 and a pancake. <laughs> okay, if they're F2.8's pancakes, that's okay. Just give me a small lens that has good reach and small lenses that are wide angle. Like a, a pancake 12 millimeter would be nice. I mean, not that the pancake is that big on, on Olympus now, but... Okay, let's see. Ray says, one of the things I've realized is that if you're shooting anything other than 35 millimeter, you should shoot with the intent of retaining 90% of the frame. Yeah. I do that with anything I shoot with because I have to crop usually to straighten the image out and then also adjust for uh, perspective errors. So I always overshoot my compositions so that I can always go back into post and crop, tilt, skew, etc. <clears throat> oh, you're welcome, Leon. <laughs> uh, thank, thanks for your excellent opinion on Ollie versus Fuji. 
Yeah, I, I don't see any reason to, to buy Fuji over Olympus. Unless you, you know, you started with Fuji. Like, you know, like I was saying about uh, back in 20, it was 2017, I think I bought into Olympus. And I went to research. I didn't actually, I didn't research. I went to the camera store and I said, I just want a small camera. I'm tired of my D750. You know, I still used it professionally, but I said, let me just get a small camera to travel around with because I was much more active, you know, three years ago or four years ago. And I had the X-T10 next to the EM10. And it was close. It was close. At that point, I was working purely on the aesthetics of the camera and just how it felt in my hand. And the EM10 felt better in my hands. So I went with the Olympus EM10, knowing nothing about Olympus or Fuji. Um, and that's 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 the world I live in now, right? But it, I, I think, you know, it's like one of those pivotal moments in your photography career or life. You know, what camera did you first buy and then where did you where did you go from there? <laughs> and I ended up with the M10 Mark II, but it was it was really a coin toss at the time. I could have just as easily went with Fuji uh, as I did Olympus back then. But after I bought the Olympus EM10, I was impressed with the image quality native, you know, relative to my D750. And a month later, I bought the Pen F, you know, because that's the camera I really wanted. <laughs> but I didn't want to spend twelve hundred dollars on a camera that I knew nothing about, you know, in terms of sensor. I knew nothing about Micro Four Thirds in twenty seventeen, or no, twenty sixteen. I'm sorry, twenty sixteen. Uh, what are your thoughts? Because a lot of folks buy a higher megapixel camera with the intent to crop, and I think only on full frame can you support heavy cropping and maybe some Sony. No, that's a myth. I mean, that's, 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 I think, I, I, well, I shouldn't say it's a myth, but I don't think that's a, that's an invalid perception of buying a, a full frame camera versus, you know, a crop sensor camera. You can crop on any camera. Clearly, especially if you're talking about only cropping in five or ten percent, it doesn't matter the sensor size. Uh, it's, it's really about getting the exposure right and your creative choices, not so much being able to crop in. So yeah, don't worry, but don't yeah, that that doesn't make any sense to me. I, I don't crop any more or less on my Micro Four Thirds than I did with my D750. Um, let me fix something here. The K Michael's saying the KP is the latest model. I wouldn't like to own one. Oh, it's the latest model. Okay. I have no idea. I like the older Pentaxes. Togier is saying 8 megapixels is about right, and that's in reference to the magazine cover pages. Hi, Rob from South Africa. Leon, oh, another Leon. How you doing? He's, Leon's always here and, and commenting on my videos. Thinking of getting the Ali 40 to 150 f2.8, only the lens hood fails is troublesome. See, people have had three fails and install a Canon compatible lens hood. Yeah, I see the same thing. Uh, yeah, just buy just buy a screw-on lens hood that's collapsible, like a rubber screw-on lens hood. Uh, but I hear I hear they're coming out with a new. Well, let me not spread rumors. I don't I don't know. <laughs> but I I know Olympus has recognized the lens hood as an issue for a lot of photographers, and they're trying to make some changes there. Um, <clears throat> but I've seen people buy like the collapsible rubber lens hoods that screw into the filter ring as, as a substitute for the Olympus version. Oh, hey, Alan, how are you? Thanks for joining. Uh, 
let's see. Oh, Garns is here. How are you? Uh, let's see. How how do I update the firmware on a Lumix lens if all I have is an Olympus camera? Um, you should be able to put the lens on the Olympus camera, then go through Olympus Workspace, and I think it'll still update. I don't, I don't have any Panasonic lenses that need updating right now to be able to show you. Um, that's a good question, though. I'll I'll come back to that because I need to load up my workspace and plug in and find the right cable. So I'll try and multitask a little bit. <clears throat> But I would just try pulling up workspace and see if uh, I need to find my cable. Uh, here it is. I label all my cables <laughs> so I can quickly find them. And I got a Panasonic lens right here. Let me put this on. I'll put this on my EM5 Mark III. I just updated the firmware on this thing. Got a full battery. Yep. Okay, standard. Oh, this has a... That should be the plug, but that looks like the... What the heck did I use to update this thing? Is that a USB? That's weird. What about this cable? I thought that was the... Definitely not that one. It's gotta be this one. But this is so huge. This is the mic, remote, HDMI, and USB. I'm very confused now why this cable doesn't fit. Crap. But, well, long story short, all I was going to do is put it, pull it in Olympus Workspace and see if it would update. But Kodachrome 40, just try that. Put, put, put the Panasonic lens in and go to the camera update in Olympus Workspace, and then it should tell you if there's an update for that lens. Uh, Alan's asking, is it possible to view more than one photo at a time on the OMD? Yes. Uh, the M10 Mark II, I have it on my... <clears throat> All right. And do I got any pictures on here? Yeah. So you know you know how you would just push play, right? To look at a picture. Then you just roll the dial back and you can look at I I kind of got it set up to a high thing here, but I think that's what you're asking, right? And you can adjust that by I believe it's in the display menu. So in the display menu, you have uh info settings and you want to go into the, the playback info, which is the first line item. 
Oh, wait a minute. That's not it. I'm sorry. The third line item there. Uh, info settings, settings. And then you can select from there how many you want to see at one time. So four, four is a good comfortable, or nine is a comfortable number for me, but let me show you what four looks like. So I just put a checkbox on the four. And now when I back out, I can see four at a time. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Eight to eighteen panty is a lovely lens, as you say, it's smaller than the seven to fourteen Ollie, and also has a filtered thread. I no longer use the Ollie yet. The panty lives on my camera now due to the filter thread. I have to, yeah. Eight to eighteen is is uh, is that at like an f four? I don't even know what speed that lens is. I try to stick to the Olympus brand lenses because sometimes you get more functionality out of your camera, like focus stacking, when you use Olympus lenses. Uh, the Pana f2.8 zoom variable aperture lens, aren't some of those only faster at the widest aperture? Yeah, that's true. So if, if it says like f2.8 to f4 on the on the lens, then it's only f2.8 at the wide end, and then it, it quickly jumps to f4. And, that, and that's true for any brand lens, not just Panasonic. Do you have any preference between Pan F, EM1 Mark II, or the new EM5 Mark III? Something to take into account. I don't make video, and one of those three will be my next purchase. Uh, if, you're, if you're a JPEG shooter, definitely get the Pan F. It has a lot of great... Uh, JPEG centric features that you won't find on any of the other Olympus cameras. And you know, if you like to see the settings when you're in the field and make those adjustments while you're actually in the field, and that and that's my preference. Um, if you're not really a JPEG shooter and you like to post process things, I think the M1 is a better choice. Um, The EM1 Mark II, that would be a very nice upgrade in terms of continuous autofocus and tracking and yeah, those those two things and the battery life is killer. So that that would be my recommendation. And if, you know, if you want to stay small and light, then the EM5 Mark III. So there's a lot of choices there. They're all very, three very different cameras and have very three different uh, sort of markets. So you need to know... Uh, what kind of shooter are you and then which one then pick one that you like best but the you know image quality wise they're all pretty equivalent yeah togear is saying that he's confused about huge zoom ranges yeah it's just for convenience you you, you know you trade convenience for quality usually I am noticing my 14 to 150 is just a hair softer than uh, my kit lenses separately, the 14 to 42 and 40 to 150, but not enough that I I don't appreciate being able to not have to swap lenses. So I think that's going to be sort of my go-to lens from now on. Uh, Roger is saying. Thinking f4 lenses Ali is working on is only for the small form factor. I own the 12 to 100 f4 Pro, and when the light drops, it's swapped out with my f2. Yeah, yeah, it's just for the smaller form factor. Like I said, it's it's good for people that are just getting in the micro four thirds, but I don't think existing owners really need to buy any of the new lenses coming on the roadmap. Hi, good morning, Chuck. How are you? Glad to have you. I'm I'm so happy. A lot of my regulars are here, uh, and and welcome to everybody that's new. Uh, let's see. Apologies for my earlier comment was unclear. Personally, for wildlife, been able to crop full frame images up to thirty percent for wildlife shots as compared to my high density APS-Cs. Yeah, I mean that has to do with the. Uh, 
the pixel pitch of the sensor itself, right? So your high density APS-Cs have a finer pixel pitch or smaller pixel pitch than say your full frame. So effectively the APS-C camera is picking up more of the lenses imperfections because it has a finer resolution of the le of the the image and because of that it's able you're you're kind of getting so it I think from that perspective uh you may see you may be able to crop in more with a full frame but that's only because you have a bigger pixel pitch so let you know like a 24 megapixel image on an APS-C versus a 24 megapixel on a full frame there's a pretty big difference in pixel pitch, and the finer pixel pitch of the APS-C is going to pick up more of the imperfections of the lens versus the 24 megapixel image on your full frame camera. Uh, so it 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 may feel like you're able to crop in more, and that's absolutely true. But I, I bet if you if you use the same lens from APS-C to full frame without changing your uh, composition, right? So what will happen is the on the full frame camera, the image will be uh, 1.5 times or whatever that magnification difference is further away than on your APS-C because APS-C will be 1.5 times closer. Uh, I think if you compare them that way, you might not find as much difference. Uh, you're going to find a lot less detail on the full frame camera. But if you compose things the same, you're getting closer with the full frame, and that in of itself will, will give you more resolution. Oh, hi, hi, Louise. Thanks for coming in. Um... Sorry you can't stay though, but I appreciate you coming in and saying hi. Uh, many wildlife first swoon over the 5DS and the AR4 due to the higher megapixel as wildlife images usually get cropped. Yes, that's true. And you know, a lot of people like the EM1X for wildlife photography. Um, but it's not an area that I'm, I'm competent in. So I don't really want to make comments uh, about full frame high density sensors, you know, that are like 40, 50 megapixel images versus saying the 20 megapixel sensor in a micro four thirds. I think the pixel density is roughly the same. So in theory, you should get about the same image. But uh, in practice, you know, those A7R4 and those 5DS shooters, you know, they're using $10,000 pieces of glass, <laughs> right? Uh, which is not something Olympus has at this point. They have their $2,000 uh, 300 millimeter F4, which people love, but I, I just don't have enough experience there to give you, a, to give you a, a, like a real life or real world uh, opinion on that. I can only speculate from what I've seen. Um, tried an old Pentax 50 f1.4 and it didn't get good results. I get a lot of good pictures out of my old Nikon glass. But if I really pixel peep, you know, yeah, they're a little bit softer than my Olympus glass. And, that, and that's just a testament to how good the Olympus lenses are. And those those old lenses were made for film cameras. Uh, where you're not going to get, you're not going to pixel peep a film, really. <laughs> not 35 millimeter film, anyway. Uh, Togier saying the, the Zuiko 50 f1.4 is great on the M43. I have the f1.8, which is really good. Um, but I have to stop it down to about f4, f5.6 to really get tack sharp images. The 24 millimeter f2.8, or is it a, I think it's an f2.8. This lens is really good.
Yeah, the, the Zuiko 24 millimeter f2.8 is really good. Um, this thing is very sharp too. But you have to stop it down a little. Oh, hi, Elaine. How are you? <laughs> I didn't say I don't have any lady photographers. I just said I'd like to have more, more diversity. That's all. There should be more, more photographers. It, I feel like it's, you know, for whatever reason, you know, the, the, and it sounds sexist, but women are more creative, you know, generally speaking, you know, on, at least from the channels that I see online. They're, they're more into crafts and making scrapbooks and uh, all, all kinds of things that I think apply to photography much more so than, you know, my channel uh, in terms of being creative. And photography should be a should be a natural outlet for for you know people that do those kinds of things um so that's that's why i'm I'm a little surprised that there aren't more uh lady photographers at least in my um in my my uh statistics demographically speaking when i look at my statistics it's like 94 to 99 percent male and I, I'm not really a gear channel, right? So I don't know. I try to try to do creative things time to time. Uh, Derek Higgins, I got the Pen F and I love it. I go street shooting all the time. Black and white are fab and yeah, Pen F is great. Hi, Roman. How are you? I'm not getting any traction on the G9. It's it's partially for two reasons. Because I, I started a fundraiser, a GoFundMe page to for people to help me buy the G9. But I don't promote it at all because it's very awkward for me to ask people to buy a camera for me. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I'm only asking because... It's not a camera I would normally buy, but it's definitely an awesome camera, and I'm more than happy to do tutorials with it, go out and shoot with it, uh, give my thoughts on it, etc. But I, I'm not going to buy a camera for $1,000 that I just absolutely do not need and don't have hardly any lenses that would be 100% compatible with it because I would lose that DFD uh uh, advantage that Panasonic Panasonic has, or I, well, I shouldn't call it advantage, but it has that DFD autofocus feature, and I only have like one lens that would work with it. Um, but I'll, I'll put a link to the the G9 GoFundMe page. Let me see. I mean, it, it's really a first world problem, right? Gee, I, I don't have money for a G9. <laughs> Let's see. Here it is. Yeah, I got I got five dollars here, and I got about ninety dollars uh, directly to my PayPal account. But I I wanted to use a GoFundMe page because uh, that that makes me sort of accountable to actually purchasing the camera because nobody knows how much I get in PayPal donations uh, towards the G9 versus. Uh, having a GoFundMe page, you can kind of see a little ticker going up. So, you know, if there's if there's people that want to ge uh, generate or donate, you know, a dollar, five dollars, whatever, to my G9 fund, uh, it would be greatly appreciated. And I think a lot of people appreciate it uh, if I can do tutorials for Panasonic. Okay, let me get caught up here. I use the OM film lens like the 50 f1.8 with focus peaking. Yeah, it's very good, Robin. <clears throat> uh, Tony saying, I never had a problem cropping 43 shots. Yeah, me neither. I mean, I if you're talking about just cropping in 5 or 10 percent or or anything for that matter, it's just all about what what composition do you want? Uh, 
Oh, hey, John. How are you? John Softley's here. He's he's <laughs> he's been email we've been emailing back and forth a little bit. Um, I always I always love getting emails from you, John. And those pictures you shared with me last, and you know which one I'm talking about. They were they were very touching. I appreciate that. Uh, hi, Rob. Very complicated question today. I drive heavily mountain bike, and the Pen F is in front of the bicycle bag. Do you think that the shaking could affect the sensor? Thanks for your answering. No, I don't think so. I mean, it's 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 wear and tear on a camera like any other camera. I don't think it's affecting the sensor any more than it would uh, any other camera. You know, as long as it's not like drop on the ground sort of force impact. If it's just kind of shaking in your bag a little bit, it's fine. Speaking of variable focus only, what in a pro lens apart from large aperture will also gain image quality? The Lumix 12 to 32 and the 12 to 60 are great in the final image. Uh, yeah, Christian, unless you need to be at uh, fast apertures at longer focal length, there's no reason to get a pro lens. I mean, I when if I know I'm going out in good light, I usually just bring my kit lenses because uh, I don't want to carry any extra weight. And when I go out at night, I carry my primes for the fast aperture. But for fast aperture zoom lenses, those are a little bit more specific to uh, wildlife photography type because you need a fast aperture to keep your shutter speed up at the longer focal lengths. And that's that's the only reason I would buy, say, a 40 to 150 Pro 2.8. Um, there, there's other applications like in portrait photography, if you want to get a little more depth of field and subject separation then you need a longer zoom or longer focal length and you throw that on top of having uh, a fast aperture, you can get good subject separation. But yeah, pro lens isn't worth it really, generally speaking, unless you have a very specific application. And that's really true for any lens. You know, don't buy a lens unless you have a very specific application for it. Okay, bye. Bye, Juan. I'd never advise, Rick is saying, I'd never advise anyone to buy 30 part lens for a pro series lens. There's a lot more to technical design of a lens hood than you would think. That's why they're so expensive. I believe that. Um, Robin's saying, like you, Rob, I post process my images to get the results I want outside of the camera. Yes. Once in a while, I'll post-process. Not very often. I only post-process to kind of crop. I use the M5 Mark I and the M1 Mark I and have taken wildlife bird shots typically and cropped in as much as I needed to. Okay. Yeah, it's... <clears throat> like I said, it's about... It's really... It's really about knowing your camera, right? Um, more so than technology in general, because like I've been saying the last three, four live streams, sensor technology has not changed much at all in the last five to ten years. And what makes Olympus really stand out is the quality of their lenses and optics. They're so good. They're so sharp. Um, they, I'm always impressed with an Olympus lens every time I buy it. I've never bought an Olympus lens that I didn't like. They've always been excellent. <laughs> Elaine's saying, no crafts for me. Um, yeah, see what I mean? I, I try to make some sort of some sort of generalization about women, and I'm way off with Elaine. She says, no crafts. So that just shows, like, why you shouldn't generalize. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you, you have to give me a little leeway because I'm old. You know, I, I, I grew up and was raised kind of in a time when a lot of things are not acceptable anymore. <laughs> I've had to correct myself so many times. As I used to use language and terminology that would be so offensive now. <laughs> but back when I was growing up, it was just, that's just how we talked. Uh, do we think twice about zooming into 100% when checking for sharpness? Uh, 
A... I... I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> Hi, Andrew. How are you? Leon's saying you ordered a lens hood to fit the Ollie 40 to 150 from China. Now the coronavirus seems to delay the order. Wow. Okay. Uh, I also have the G9. It works much better with Panasonic lenses than it does with Olympus. Colors are nicer and images seem smoother. Yeah, like I said, you know, the it it matters buying the, the same brand lenses with your camera. Uh, they're designed to work together specifically. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Yeah, I I have no reason to buy a G9. But I'm happy to do it. I mean, even if the fund me gets about halfway there, I'm just go buy it. But you know, it it the thing is, right? If I go buy a G9 on my own with the intent to do tutorials and comparisons and help people make a better decision, right, between Panasonic and Olympus. And then nobody watches it. It's like, I just wasted, you know, $1,000 or whatever I'm going to pay for that thing because nobody's interested in my G9 opinions. <laughs> uh, so that that's another reason I'm not really motivated to buy a G9 because it's, it's a little bit of a business risk too. Uh, hi Juan, how are you? Uh, I know you must be busy, but I'd love to see that comparison. We talked about the EM10 Mark III or EM5 Mark III with the 12 to 40 Pro versus the Fuji XT30 with an 18 to 55. This one I'm waiting like crazy to know if it's uh. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I've never shot the M5 Mark III with the 12 to 40 Pro on it versus the XT30. Um, the best place to put that, Leon, is on my forum, because on my forum I have a thread for YouTube video suggestions, but I'll, I'll write it down. Because not everybody wants to, you know, register their email and crap to, to sign up for my forum just to post a suggestion, right? So I'll, I'll write it down. Because I honestly, I totally forgot about it. So that's that's why I started that thread on my forum is so I can always go back and review plus the 12 to 40 versus the XT30 and the 18 to 55. Okay. I'll do a photo walk. We're, we're not supposed to have a good day until Wednesday or Thursday. So it, yeah, it's going to take a little while. Uh, but it's it's on my list now. Comparable in sharpness, wondering micro contrast. Okay. I, I don't know if those are things I can... Honestly, micro contrast is something I, I've never been able to distinguish with my own eye and say, see right here, this is where it is. <laughs> it's, it's one of those elusive things for me. Uh, because I, I remember people were were saying, look at this image and look at the, this image. We use this lens on this lens on that picture and this lens on that picture. And look at the difference in the micro contrast. And then they would punch in and zoom in and I'm looking. And I'm like, I don't see it. I mean, I, it's a fine lens, but what are you talking about micro contrast? I, I, I don't know why I can't see it. I never knock it and say it doesn't exist, right? I mean, it's enough people say that micro contrast is a real thing. It's just not something I can see, you know? I I don't know. So I don't know if I can compare that. I can compare sharpness. That's an easy metric. Uh, I can compare colors. You know, that's an easy metric. But micro contrast, <laughs> I don't know. I'm not going to be able to say 
yeah, this has better micro contrast. I can say an image's contrast has more contrast. I can see that. But someone was showing me a couple of images and they're like, look at the micro contrast on this versus that. And I'm like, what the heck are you talking about? They're both nice images. Uh, the sensor on a mountain bike. I too have used the carry camera on a bike and worried about it. But was informed that when the camera is off, the sensor is locked in place. It does have a parked position. I do know that. I don't know if it's locked. Because honestly, is it the Pen F? Let me see. The sensor's still moving inside. It's not locked. <laughs> Uh, so like I said, for just, just normal shaking like this in a bag, you'll be okay. Especially if it's there's a little bit of padding, that, that motion is dampened a little bit. I mean, I wouldn't drop it. I have dropped this camera on the concrete though, and it went rolling down. Uh, fortunately I only dented one corner of this camera, and then there's a couple of scuffs on the sides, but... I have dropped this thing hard <laughs> on the concrete, and it's still fine. So in a bag, it's perfectly fine. Elaine says she post-process. See, that's the creative part, right, Elaine? You can be very creative in post-processing. I think you said you used that, uh, that other software, Photoscape, right? Michael Morin, Rob, I have the 14 to 150 kit lens, the 17 f1.8, the 40 to 150, and the 60 macro. What would you suggest I get next? Either the new 12 to 45 f4 or another prime. Uh, my question would be is what do you need to take pictures of, <laughs> uh, Mike? Because like I said, lenses, lens purchases should be very, very specific at this point, especially you got everything covered from 14 millimeters up to 150. I don't know what a 12 to 45 would add to your kit in terms of expanding your photography. Um, you know, it'd be a good lens though, is maybe you should try something wider, maybe an eight millimeter fisheye or the nine to 18 millimeter. Uh, skip the 12, cause 14 is pretty close, but go wider so you can do some astrophotography. Uh, 12, 12 to 45, that's not wide enough or fast, or fast enough over what you already have. I, I would go, I would consider the, the, a wide, a wide angle lens, even, even the generic, uh, like Sam Yang's or whatever those brands are, they have some seven millimeter rectilinear lenses that are like F2. Um, go super wide and super fast and have fun with that. That would be my recommendation. Uh, what surprised me that the zoom in the JPEG show the zoom in the image, but the raw files will always at the wides of the image. Is that normal? Robin, I think you're, you're referring to the digital teleconverter, then that would be the case that your JPEG is showing the cropped image, but the raw file is still the full <clears throat> image without the digital teleconverter applied. Uh, yeah, that is that is the case. Because the all the, all the digital teleconverter, is, it, it takes the image sensor and just crops in. But the, if you're shooting raw plus JPEG, the raw file is still gonna be the full image without a digital teleconverter convert uh, applied. With any optical lens, you know, 40 to 150, it shouldn't make any difference. Your JPEG image should be cropped the same as your raw image if you're using a true lens with that at, at whatever given focal length. <clears throat> I was the first female hired to work in the photo store in 1979. And that wasn't that long ago, right? <laughs> Elaine is saying uh, she was the first female hired to work in a photo store. I mean, they're like the first female ever <laughs> or just at that store? Because you, you should be famous if that's the case, if you're like the first female ever to work in a photo store. 
back in the day when I was in a photo club and there were several lady photographers, but when I went back years later, there were none. Yeah, that's weird. I guess they're all using their iPhones now, like everybody else. Like I said, I, I shouldn't be, I shouldn't, shouldn't make any assumptions. Uh... Yeah, Rick is right in, in reference to shaking delicate electronic equipment. You know, just avoid it if you can. <laughs> uh, as always, right? Uh, I was told by other members that the change to digital and the need to process your own images was the reason. <clears throat> oh, okay. This is in reference to there being less lady photographers in the photo club. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Hopefully that'll change, though, you know, with people like Elaine. <laughs> Rob, getting the G9 won't be enough. You would also have to get the Pana lenses. Yeah, like I said, I have, I have the Panasonic 25 millimeter uh, prime, the F1.7. So what I might do is, uh, you know, get the, uh, I'd really like to get the, the 25 millimeter Leica from Panasonic. Oh, I forgot, I just got this 12 to 32 also. I mean, these are not lenses you would put on a G9 normally. Uh, but yeah, I, I would get a lens, I would buy a lens separately once I have a G9, then I have reasons to buy Panasonic lenses. Like I would strongly consider their, their 35 to 100 f2.8 uh, or compare, or their 12 to 32 f2, or 12 to 35 f2.8. One second. Sorry, I had to turn my space heater on. It's like 50 degrees in my room right here. 55 degrees right now. <laughs> Freezing in here. Uh, but yeah, Ray, you're right. How Victor... Lady photographer sounds Victorian. I guess. Um... Yeah, if I, if, if I, when I say it out loud, I when I when I hear myself, you're right. <laughs> oh, that's right, Elaine. How did those updates go? I remember you were you you were going to buy a cable to update your firmware and your camera. Uh, John's asking, can all the Ollie Pro lenses be used for focus stacking? I believe so. I mean. I don't think Olympus says definitively that they do, but uh, I've never heard of a Pro Lens not working for stacking. Rob, when the Ollie 75 photo shoot challenge happened, oh, <laughs> I know. It, when when the weather gets a little better, I just you know, it's it's like astrophotography and and all kinds of other things. My schedule and good weather have to be in the same on this at the same time. I, I I will definitely make an effort though. I think about it every day, like I need to take the 75 out. Uh Uh, Richard's saying, I might prefer the G9 and Panasonic lenses over Olympus. And then the channel's gone. <laughs> I seriously doubt it. 
Slato's saying, Micro Contrast is the Loch Ness Monster of photography. I know. Some people see it and others just don't see it at all. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just it's beyond me, like a lot of things. Tony says uh, composition is way more important than micro contrast. Uh, it is for me, obviously, because I can't see it anyway. <laughs> Digital grandpa's here. Hey, buddy, how are you? <laughs> that was a great photo walk we had. There was a lot of uh, a lot of people were interested in how that went, and uh, so I talked about it. I think in my last live stream more than I, I haven't even mentioned it today. But Digital Grandpa and I went on a photo walk last week in dc and we had a great time and i posted you know just a few of the images from that uh on my instagram but also check out digital grandpa and i also told the story about how he got his his uh handle there digital grandpa in the last live stream it was very it's really interesting surprised me a little bit <laughs> Keep shaking that sensor. <laughs> it seems to me that micro contrast or pop appears in images with good light as opposed to not. Yes. Having good light is the key to photography. Uh, don't the profiles play a role in micro contrast? I don't know. Like I said, if I knew what to look for, if I could see it, I could comment on micro contrast and what affects it, but I have no idea. Oh, Mike, so you already have a 9mm fisheye. Um, so you're still thinking the 12 to 45. I guess. I. I forget the other lenses you have now, but you had everything covered. Let me, let me look again. You have a 14 to 150. Yeah, if you have a 14 to 150, I don't, I don't see how, uh, what what a 12 to 45 will do for you unless it's like a ton sharper you know uh let's see i use the olympus oh i might have scrolled past everybody okay richard thanks for sharing that richard said he tried to updating the panasonic lens on the pen f the Olympus software won't allow it. It just shows the camera body details and nothing for the lens. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna look into that more because I could I swear I was able to update a Panasonic lens before. I just don't have I could have sworn I've done it before. Firmware panel lenses. I mean, now that I have a Lumix camera, but I don't think I, I've done it anyway. Uh, okay, Richard, th thanks for sharing that though. Uh, I use the Olympus 14 to 42 kit lens and notice that the zoom in image is only recorded in the JPEG file. But the whole unzoomed image in the raw file. I don't know why that's happening. You, make sure you don't have your digital teleconverter turned on. I just can't. It just makes no sense to me how that's possible, <laughs> uh, Robin. If I take an image, my JPEG image is cropped exactly the same as the raw image with the digital teleconverter off.
Rob, for astrophotography, I prefer using my Pentax with the Rokinon 12. And Astro Tra yeah, five minute exposures. Yeah, that's, I was looking at some Pentax. I had some Pentax lenses in my shopping cart. Uh, not shopping cart, my wish list for a while. Um, let me see. I think I took them out because I decided I wasn't going to do it. Yeah, I, I I took them out of my shop wish list. But I was looking at some lenses for my Pentax. Or not for my Pentax, because I don't have the astro function on that old camera. But if I was going to buy another Pentax, maybe the K7 or something that has that function... And these are the lenses I would have chose. Yeah, 12 millimeters on an APS-C is certainly, you know, wide enough. But on, on a, yeah, on a micro four thirds, I don't feel like 12 millimeters is wide enough. Oh, hey, Arthur, how are you? Uh, hi, hi, Catalan, how are you? Hello, hello. Wow, a lot of people coming in late today. I tried to start a little earlier today because I need to go out. I'm, I'm meeting a client today. Um, when you already have awesome composition, it's nice to have good sharpness and micro contrast. Okay, Juan. Uh, always, right? Ezwan, how are you? Thanks for coming in. I don't, I don't know, Juan is saying, I don't know why some people think that having better gear makes you immediately a worse photographer with worse composition. I, that's, yeah, I don't understand. Lauren's saying micro, yeah, and Lauren would have good feedback on this. Micro contrast might be the next bokeh craze equal to the pursuit of perfection, yet boring photograph. Personally, if this is what matters most, it really is a waste of time to view. I know. And I, I got your email, Lauren, with your latest portfolio. Nice. Very nice images there. I noticed you're shooting a lot of Nikon, though. <laughs> a D3500, I think. There was one image from a pen PLH you had there of a guy, the black and white. That was pretty nice. I like that one. I mean, I like them all, but that, that one, the one I like the most actually happened to be an Olympus camera. And because it was black and white. Uh, Derek says, I have a Sigma 19 F2.8. Yes, it rattles, but when on the mount and turned on, the rattle disappears. Is this with all Sigmas? It's very sharp lenses. Thanks. No, not all Sigma lenses rattle. Only a few. I think like the 60 millimeter f2.8, apparently the 19 f2.8. Uh, but I've owned I've owned Sigma lenses in the past, and none of them had a rattle. Uh, but they were for my Nikon camera. I don't know. I haven't owned any Sigma lenses since I I shot with my Nikon. Rob, forgot to mention that I am always looking for maximum sharpness. That's why I'm waiting. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, if you want ultimate sharpness, money, no object. Yeah, I think the 12 to 45 will be interesting when it comes out. Rob, do you use UV filter on your lenses to protect them? I do not. I do not. I used to do it on my uh, Nikon glass, the wide angle lenses. Uh but on the micro four thirds, you know, I can usually just uh, get a small lens hood because the system is so small overall, adding a lens hood doesn't add much. So now I just go with the lens hood to protect the front element. Uh, on the Nikon glass, you know, uh, putting a lens hood on the Nikon glass usually doubled the size of the lens. <laughs> so when I packed them in, when I packed the lenses in my bag, I would reverse the lens hoods back onto the lens so I could pack the thing smaller into my bag. 
Hence, I used a UV filter to protect the lens while I was in the bag uh, in lieu of a lens cap, right? Um, but with Micro Four Thirds, everything is so small, even with the lens hood, I don't bother with the, the UV filters anymore. I specialize in boring and blurry photos. It's just my jam. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, hi, Siegfried. How are you? Thanks for coming in. Um, yeah, Mike, a 12 millimeter full frame. Yeah, that's that's six millimeter on a micro four thirds. Yeah, that's plenty wide. No question. I have a 20 millimeter F18 that I used to use on my Nikon for Astro, which I really loved. About your comment that 12 millimeter is not wide enough, what are the situations you have in mind? Is that specifically for interiors? Yeah, 12 millimeter on micro four thirds is not wide enough really for astrophotography or really even doing real estate photography. It's just not wide enough uh, for small rooms. And then for astrophotography, you, you can barely, you're only capturing about a quarter of the sky, even with a 12 millimeter uh, lens. You're not even a quarter of the sky with a 12 millimeter uh, on a micro four thirds. And if you want to capture the entire Milky Way, you know, over a horizon, you really need to be seven millimeters or so. Uh, and with high elevation, et cetera. I mean, I'm not an astrophotographer professional by any means, but I have tried time to time with a 14 millimeter, a 12 millimeter, my eight millimeter. And uh, when I was using my Nikon, uh, I used a six millimeter fisheye for some astrophotography. And that's the only way I was able to capture the entire horizon uh, and also with astrophotography, you have to do a lot of image stacking, right? So your exposures are going over, you know, several minutes and the sky is going to move. And then when you restack those images, you're effectively cropping in even more, uh, with a 12 millimeter field of view on a, on a micro four thirds. So yeah, it's just not wide enough. You know, you, you need to be as wide as, and as fast as you can. And I feel like, like uh, Ray, who was it? Michael says he uses a 12, God, who is it? Yeah, Michael says he uses a 12 millimeter on a full frame. That's a six millimeter on a micro four thirds. And that's, yeah, that's going to be wide enough to capture the entire Milky Way over a horizon. And then you can start stacking images and doing long exposures and still have 90% of the picture there. So that, that's, that's what I meant by it's not wide enough. You know, if you're doing single shot photography, it's, it's still not quite there, but it might be good enough. Uh, Michael says, Rob, on another mode of astro is planetary. For that, you really need to use a digiscope. If your combination of lens and scope don't give you at least a thousand millimeters, you won't be satisfied. <laughs> I know. Uh, I was thinking about, and this is the only reason I haven't sold it. I have a, I have a full frame 150 to 600 lens, which would give me a 1200 millimeter equivalent on my micro four thirds. But then I have to buy a tracker, right, with a motor. So, uh, you know, until I really get into astrophotography, I don't want to go crazy with gear buying buying uh, trackers and yeah digiscope type photography it's very very specialized uh it's not it's not astrophotography is not really if you want to get into it especially uh planetary astrophotography it's not for the light-hearted or faint-hearted you have to be you have to be pretty all in Uh, Ray's asking for waterfalls and landscapes. Yeah, 12 millimeters fine for most of that. Uh, again, it depends on how far away you are from, from the, uh, subject, but, uh, 
I I would still go with a nine millimeter for landscapes. I think that's a very comfortable width. Nine or ten millimeters. Uh, you can get by with twelve on landscapes and for waterfalls. Uh, twelve is fine. Um, because usually you want to get close enough to the waterfall, but not so close and capture a lot of the detail in the rocks and, and everything else. Siegfried says, Rob, I recall you were testing the Olympus 8mm and you had some concerns. Have you found the answers? Uh, wow, you know, that's been a while. I haven't... I, I've been using the lens, you know, pretty regular in my pro work. I haven't had any issues with it. Uh, I The only issue I think initially I was having was something to do with the... Uh, uh, Distortion correction and post-processing, but I've kind of nailed that. So if maybe if you can remind me what concern I was having with it, I, I don't have any concerns now at all, though. It seems to be fine. I mean, it's all I use now. Uh, I use, you know, when I go out to my photo shoots, I usually bring my 8mm fisheye and my kit lens for some rectilinear exterior shots if I can get some distance. Um, because like I said, everything gets delivered at two megapixels anyway, so a kit lens is more than good enough for that. <laughs> I spoke to my bank manager. Uh, John Softly, OM Zico lens has always had metal or rubberized screw lens hoods, never plastic or bayonet. Yeah, that's true. My, where's my 12? Or my, this is my 24 millimeter. It, it came with this rubber, it's not collapsible, but a nice rubber lens hood. And it goes on, then you screw it right here to tighten it. And this also fits my uh, 50 millimeter. Um, yeah, these Zuiko lenses are awesome. You know, John, I've been thinking about getting that 135 f3.5 from Olympus. Is that is that the one you said was pretty decent? The 135 f3.5 from Olympus? The Zwicko, because I have it at the local camera store for like $49, and I'm like, well, okay, for $49. <clears throat> oh, yeah, the distortion correction. Yeah, I, I fixed all of that, the distortion correction. Uh, basically, what I did is I found a profile... I set it up as a preset now in Lightroom, so I can't even remember which profile I used. I think it was the Sigma fisheye lens, and I applied that correction. Then I added a little plus or minus in the manual distortion correction. And I set it up all as a preset, so I just click a button now to, uh, to correct for the distortion. So I can't remember the exact settings anymore. But I did fix all of that, and... Uh, the manual 7.5 millimeter, I don't think, I don't have a cheaper 7.5 millimeter, so I never tested for that. Let me think. Yeah, I, I didn't test a 7.5 millimeter. I just don't have one. If I did, I don't use it anymore. Yeah, I, I don't ha Oh, I do have... I do have one. But I never tested it. It's a 6.5 millimeter, actually. And it's a fisheye. I don't bother with that lens. It's, 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 only, it's only sharp at f5.6, and then... Uh, it's a Nikon mount, so I have to use a Nikon adapter. But I, if I was planning to buy another one, I didn't because I have the 8mm now. So sorry, Siegfried, I have no idea about the 7.5. Okay, bye, Mike. Have a good breakfast. Uh, th thanks for coming in. Yes, the 135 F35 is as good as the 24 Okay, good to know. 
The Samyang 7.5. Yeah, I never bought that lens, uh, Siegfried, so I didn't test it. Although I hear good things about it, but I never, I never, I never owned that lens or had it. Rick's saying he had the Seven Artists and 7.5 fisheye, and then got the eight millimeter pro fisheye. Can't fault the Olympus. Seven Artisans was okay, but not true 180. Yeah. The 7.5 fisheye from Seven Artisans. I don't know. I, I like I like my little Pixco $65 fisheye. I mean, it's an f3.9 or it's effectively an f4, but that lens is good enough if you're going to be messing around with fisheye and just having fun. It doesn't need to be tack sharp, though it's not bad. It's not bad at all. Yeah, I think the seven artisan lens were all APS-C size, right? <laughs> or a, a, they have an APS-C size image circle. Oh, man. Anyhow, man, it's nice to have, you know... <laughs> I'm I'm a little bit I feel a little humbled because there's so many of you here that have so much more experience in photography than me, and uh, I always I always feel kind of like what what could I possibly offer you know you guys as as a photographer other than you know how to push a certain button on a camera somewhere. <laughs> I've always wondered, like, with the image circle coming out as APS-C, how much flaring that would cause inside the camera. You know, because they don't, you know, if, if the image circle is covering everything, how much, I wonder how much light bounces around inside because of that extra circle kind of going around. Maybe nothing, but. Because when you put this on, it goes in nice and tight. But not with the uh, not with the adapters, right? These adapters, like think about all the light that bounces around inside this uh, circle, or inside the adapter here. I used to put uh, electrical tape around the adapter. <laughs> just to try to eliminate light leaks and things. I mean, it was all in my head, but this was very, very early on. Oh, thanks, Siegfried. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to be doing some more Flash tutorial videos. Um... Uh, now that I got my macro extension tubes. Because the Godox TT350 is really kind of an indoor flash. You can use it outdoors for some things. Or a lot of things. But it does best indoors. Because it's just a small flash. Uh, Rick is saying it prefers the Samyang. Okay. I mean, a 7 Artisans... Some of the lenses almost look like they're CCTV lenses, not APS-C lenses. So the image circle is even smaller. But I, I, you know, I just don't buy them when I start to look at them. I mean, some of the seven artisans, not all of them. Some of them look CCTV kind of design. Oh, thank you, Bryce. Thank you, Richard. Kevin, thanks. Patrick saying on Sony APS-C, some wide aperture vintage lenses would generate purple spots, sensor reflection from yeah. See, I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. I knew there would be some issues with having too big of an image circle going inside your little mirror box or mirrorless box. Um. I mean it. 
I I noticed that when I use my extension tubes, that the longer extension tubes, I feel like I'm seeing a little bit of reflection uh, coming from somewhere. The image gets a little bit softer. I know I'm losing light and I'm I'm stretching the image and all of the optics involved with you know using a extension tube. But nobody really talks about the fact that by expanding the image circle, you're now bouncing light all over the inside of the, the mirror box or mirrorless box. And that, that seems to be another issue with using extension tubes to some extent. Um, now the bellows tubes that are really long, those accordion looking things, uh, you know, they're, they're a matte fabric or rubber or whatever. So virtually no light gets bounced around, you know, in that sense. But these extension tubes and adapters are hard metal, hard plastics, painted. So there's always some reflection. Um, Rob, the APS-C7 artisan behaves like an old OM-35 millimeter fisheye on an M43 converter, only using the center of the lens. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing about adapting APS-C image circle or larger lenses. You're getting the sweet spot of the lens, right? What do you think of infrared conversions for M43? I'm thinking of getting one. Yeah, I'm thinking about it too, actually. Infrared conversion. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I've been thinking about a monochrome converted camera, just buying one separately. Uh, the infrared conversions, that would be really interesting too. I, I, I don't do a lot of infrared photography. Um, I, I mean, I, have the, I, I do it with the filters and things and the results are okay. Uh, but if I was hardcore in infrared, I would definitely consider getting one. <laughs> Elaine says she adds flair in post-processing. Thank you, John. Hello, Archie. How are you? All the way from Dubai. That's awesome. An IR converted G9. I don't know. That, like I said, if you're heavy into into a very specific type of photography, why not get the best you can, right? Or or as close as you can without spending a fortune. And doing these conversions are not. They don't cost any more than buying a lens, really, right? Um. That's how I was thinking about getting a monochrome converted lens. And maybe, you know, you could even get these full spectrum converted lenses where they take everything off and it's just a bare sensor practically. I mean, all these things look really cool. If I had the time, I would love to do that, but I just, <laughs> I don't have time to do it all. You could change the Fujifilm camera to infrared shooting camera, just a thought. Oh, no, I would not do that to my X-T30. Like I said, I'd probably just buy one that's already done and get a, a warranty with it. Because um, I remember the Fuji X-T1, they came out with a... Uh, I think they came out with an infrared version. Or was it an astro version? I forget exactly. Oh, thank you, Archie. I try. I try to get them better. When I when I look at all my videos, man, I, I thought by now after, it's been just a hair over three years. I, I started in January of 2017, and now it's January 2020, right? So I'm, that's one, two, three. So 18, 19, 20. So that's, yeah, a solid three years. Uh... I thought by now I would have like this really high production value type videos. And I mean, the only thing I think I've really improved is, is my camera presence. I'm not so, 
Uh, I'm a little more animated now in my presence on camera, but... Uh, do you think a, saw, a small softbox diffuser is necessary for macro with a flash on the TT350? Um, it helps. It helps. How small? Because um, really with macro photography, it really depends how you're set up. And when you start adding accessories to your gear, it's about workflow, right? So, um, I mean, if you're on a tripod where you can set the camera up on a self-timer, excuse me, then you don't need a softbox or a diffuser. You can uh, just bounce the light off a piece of paper and get kind of the same effect because the flash will have enough power. If you're, if you're uh, hand-holding the camera, then, you know, because we all only have two, two hands, right? Then, yeah, having a diffuser on the flash makes more sense in terms of workflow because then you can hand-hold the flash, hand-hold the camera at the same time. Uh, but, yeah, to, to avoid shadows and things or to minimize the shadows, uh, having a softbox or diffuser helps. But there's different ways of doing it. Sometimes you can have your softbox diffuser, maybe a, a five or six inch head on here, and then a, a piece of paper on the right side to diffuse even more, right? At, to work as a reflector or just a regular reflector. You know, everything helps. Depends, again, how evenly you want the light to be. And then if you want to get really carried away, you can buy one of those ring flashes, which I'm going to demonstrate in my upcoming tutorial or video on macro photography. Um, <clears throat> and the Olympus flash, they have a flash on each side coming from both sides. Uh, one of their special macro flashes. So um, the question is, do I think it's necessary? It's not necessary. It's, it's, just, uh, it's just something to help you in your workflow. But ultimately, you can achieve soft lighting with just the bare flash and a piece of paper, right? <laughs> Sometimes I would just curl the paper like this. You know? I would just, I would just hold the flash like this with a piece of paper. <laughs> uh... I mean, that's, that's as good a diffuser as any for macro work. <clears throat> it's not good for portrait work because it kills too much light, but for macro work, it's fine. Um, <clears throat> Kevin, I'm not saying I like the XT30, but I just... I don't, I don't hate it so much that I would get it converted. <laughs> <laughs> do I have a camera I hate that I would convert I don't hate any camera I like them all anyhow uh, do you think hi Rob thanks for your really good videos on the EM10 Mark II which helped me upgrade from the EP5 to the EM10 Mark II what do you think of the Sigma 1960 <clears throat> Uh, you know, the, everybody seems that owns, I don't have any of the Sigma lenses. Everybody that has them seems to really like them. Uh, so I think, you know, if you're on a budget to some extent, yeah, go ahead and get those. Uh, but I, I don't own any myself to say that how good or bad they are. But if anybody in the in the chat room has those lenses, you know, let uh, Ron know what you think of them, because I, I don't own those lenses. I've been I've been sort of jaded from not jaded. Uh, anyway, I don't like Sigma lenses anymore. Ever since my experience with them on my Nikon camera, and I avoid them now uh, whenever I can mainly because of focusing issues that I was having with my Nikon and some minor, minor quality issues. With my Olympus glass, I've never had any issues. Well, 
except for my 14 to 42 pancake. That thing, that thing just died on me for no reason. Uh, thank you, Andrew. So, Rick, you're going to shoot everything in monochrome and letterbox format. I don't know if I'd do it the whole year. I might do it for one photo walk. <laughs> Have you decided which camera you want from Olympus? I have not. I have not. I I feel like the EM1 Mark III would be kind of fun to get and relevant and current. Uh but I haven't I haven't I haven't decided yet. I'll I'll give it some more serious thought this week. I just I just have so much on my plate this this weekend. Um and I got the email on Wednesday or Thursday asking what camera do I want. And since then, I've just been kind of a little bit overwhelmed with other stuff. Uh, Hassan is saying, how to set minimum shutter speed during aperture priority on the EM10 for street photography? There's no direct way to do it. Uh, the indirect way, let me see if that still works. It's been a while since I've tried this. Okay, so, and I, I assume you mean with auto ISO, right? Aperture priority and auto ISO. But I'll, I'll lock the ISO in at 12,000. And then, let me open the aperture up. Oh, it's already wide. Okay, let me see if this still works. What I used to do is go into the flash and set the slow limit. So let me set that to 1 125th. Let's see if that. Okay, that's good. That seems to be working. Let me back it down. there used to be this hack where you could uh, slet, set the slow limit, the sync limit. Let me, let me crank the ISO up here. All right. Okay, good. It's doing it there. Let me see if this still works. Come on. Go out. Yeah, so what you what you can try is go into your uh, flash menu and set the slow limit to one one twenty fifth or whatever the minimum shutter speed that you want, uh, and that seems to work. So I can change that to that seems to work with auto ISO and aperture priority. So if I lower the shutter limit down to 1 60th, it's not really working. Hold on. Yeah, honestly, there's not really a way to do it, but let me tell you, you know, you can try that that trick and see what kind of results you get. Um, but what I would do is, honestly, I would just shoot in shutter priority and set the shutter speed that you want and fix the ISO. Because if you're shooting uh, 
in relatively low light and you want a faster shutter speed so like street photography right kind of towards the evening going in the shutter priority the, the camera is going to keep the aperture wide open anyway if you want a wide aperture if you're trying to use a narrow aperture say f8 or f11 for some reason that's not going to work uh, but if you're trying to keep your aperture wide open the camera is going to keep the aperture wide open anyway uh, in low light when you set higher shutter speeds if you're trying to set a lower shutter speed say like 1 20th or 1 30th of a second i found that when you're shooting in silent mode on the em10 mark ii it will let the shutter speed drop down to like 1 20th of a second in silent mode uh, before bumping the iso so it's it's a little bit more complicated question <laughs> Uh, to answer because it really depends on how you're shooting what shutter speed minimum shutter speed you want versus what kind of lighting conditions are you in because there's there's ways around working the the minimum shutter speed right minimum or maximum depends so i i it's that, that's why i'm struggling a little bit to answer your question so you want to set minimum shutter speed during aperture priority for street photography um it just depends what minimum you want if you want one two hundredth of a second uh so may maybe you can elaborate a little bit more what minimum shutter speed do you want then i can give you a little better answer Uh, wow, let me catch up here. How do you convince someone who wants to buy the Sony a6000 just because she thinks that the Sony is a good brand to buy an Olympus? She did no research and I tried to convince her. <laughs> you can't convince people. People do what they want. <laughs> That's what I found, you know. Um, honestly, unless somebody asks you for your, for your opinion or advice, if you, there's no point in giving it because they're not going to listen to you. You know, a lot of people ask me questions, so I'm happy to, to answer. But if somebody doesn't ask me my opinion on something, then if I give it to them, it doesn't matter. Oh, thank you, Elaine. Um, were you, Archie's asking, were you able to send your MK3 for repairs? No, I, I haven't sent it in yet. I should. I should, but I'm just using it too much. I don't want to part with it. Uh, and it's not a button I use very much. It's the, the shutter uh, It's the shutter mode button, I think, that, that broke. It still works if I push it manually with like a, a pencil. I'm not a pencil, but a pen. <laughs> so the button still works. It's just missing the cap. Uh, let's see. Macro, you can also use a bed sheet as a tent so your flash is diffused through the cotton. Yeah, I mean, there's so many ways to diffuse light. Okay, you're welcome, Bryce. I, I can't remember what I was talking about with you. Maybe it was the macro thing, uh, diffusing light. Lauren has some feedback, but yeah, Hassan, I need a little bit more information to kind of give you a recommendation. Uh, I own the Sigma 60 f 2.8, and it's a great lens. Tax sharp and at half the price point. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Yeah, like I said, people that own, that, own those Sigma lenses for Micro Four Thirds seem to love them, but I, I just don't buy them. Okay, goodbye, Richard. Thanks for coming in. I used to have a Nikon D70. That thing was lucky I didn't run over it with my cat. With my car. And you had focusing issues. I assume that was with Sigma lenses, right, Elaine? The Sigma lenses and your Nikon D70, not, not the D70 in of itself. Has anyone used Olympus Macro Arm Light? I bought it for 20 euros yesterday. Wow, no, I've never used it, but that's cool. 
Uh, you're welcome, Tony. Lauren says, Sony menus are not so great. Yeah. Yeah, the only menu system I ever used that I really like was actually the Panasonic Lumix GX85. Those menus are very, uh, I was able to quickly wrap my head around it. Um, like I could probably pick it up right now, even though I haven't touched that camera in a month, and dive in and make all the settings I need pretty quickly. And I'm, I'm talking about weirdo settings, not like the general ISO aperture shutter. But like a Sony, you know, any camera, those should be the easiest things to do. Aperture, shutter, and ISO. But it's, it's the little things, right? The, the special features and things. And the Panasonic's the only camera that I've ever been able to just quickly make those kinds of settings. The Fuji menus are, I had to struggle with every other camera except Panasonic. The best advice is don't give advice. I know, right? Oh, is it raining over there, Tony? <laughs> wow, it's always raining in London, though, I hear, right? That's kind of the running joke here, at least on the sitcoms that I see on TV. <laughs> Um, Lauren's saying on street using slow lenses, use shutter priority, using fast lenses, use aperture preferred, and then bump the ISO when needed. They really should have added this. Okay. I mean, that's good advice, right? Like, if you have a fast lens, then use aperture priority if you want that, you know, shallower depth of field or you want the higher shutter speed from the wider aperture. And slow lenses, yeah, go in the shutter priority and the lens is going to be wide open anyway. Or forced wide open from the camera. Uh, a friend of mine bought a Sony camera because Sony makes good TVs and <laughs> I could not persuade him that features like live composite and live time are great. Yeah, you can't change people's minds. People buy what they want and they need to be happy with, with their purchase. Because if you tell them to buy Olympus and in the back of their mind they want a Sony, they're never going to like the Olympus. You know, without, I don't know, you know, I, people, people buy what they want and what they, they like, and they have to be happy with their decision. You, you rarely find people to say that I regret ever doing this. You know what I mean? Um, you know, that, that's why I hate these. I switched from this to that type videos where they, I mean, I'm being a hypocrite because I have one where I said I don't miss full frame cameras, but I wasn't talking specifically about I switched from Nikon to Olympus. I was talking about the format full frame going to micro four thirds and why I don't really miss it anymore. But I, just these videos that I switched from Canon to Sony and Sony to Canon, it's just, you know, silly to me. Oh, I see. So that's why I used your Nikon D3500, Lauren, is in your portfolio because you, it has a minimum shutter speed and auto ISO. Yeah, it's true. You have to get like the Pen F or, you know, one of the higher end micro four thirds to get that minimum shutter speed setting. And as you stated earlier, you can work around that depending on how fast or slow your lens is, etc. 
Oh, finally. I'm I'm a little behind again, but Hassan's saying let's say auto ISO minimum shutter one one twenty fifth. Um yeah, in low light, just actually just shoot in shutter priority. Uh, and set your shutter speed to one one twenty fifth, and your lens will stay wide open. But what aperture are you going for? Are you going for wide open aperture, or do you want to stop it down to something? Then that's a little trickier to do on an EM10. John is saying he found a Tamron ninety millimeter f two point five in a box of OM lenses. Has anyone used that? It was a great lens on the film cameras. No, I've never used that one. But 90 millimeter was really popular focal length, I think, for film camera portrait work. Um, Rob, do you use Lightroom? I'm thinking of switching Lightroom from to Lightroom from Luminar. Um, I feel like. Uh, really either all of the different software packages will deliver very good results um, i haven't used luminar recently and the copy i have uh, all i can do is i i really can i i did play with luminar a little while and the results i got were fine but lightroom the main advantage to lightroom for me is the uh the the workflow and managing the images so the data asset management part of it and i was able to do a lot of things like if i want to sort my 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 images by camera by iso by lens by focal length by aperture whatever i want to sort my images by in a particular group i can do that very easily and then i have keywords and comments and uh there's also plugins and presets that are widely available uh that i use the time to time there's the color profile matching. Uh, you know, if you if you buy the X right and you want to you want to do uh, you want to get perfect colors. You know, there's there's a lot of third party things like from X right that will let you calibrate your monitor, calibrate your Lightroom with your camera and lens. So there, there's a lot of a, very professional features in Lightroom that I didn't see in Luminar. If you don't need any of that stuff, right? If you're just a, a enthusiast photographer, then Luminar is fine in terms of image to image uh, correction and post processing. But if you start developing a huge collection of images, and especially if you're going to work professionally, I know Lightroom definitely has sort of that bandwidth to help you with that in the long term. I don't know if Luminar does or not. So that would be the only hesitation. Only thing I would say about Lightroom is if you're thinking about growing professionally, it, it just has sort of a workflow and support from third parties to help you do that very easily. But it's not going to give you any better results than any other software out there. Uh, so if, if that's what you're going for. So Patrick has a 90 millimeter 2.5 and says it's excellent on his Sony. It's a little too big for his M43. Okay. Yeah, I man, when you think about it, a 90 millimeter f2.5, that's going to be a big lens, right? Uh, how do you usually store your cameras if you're not going to go use it for a long time? Ooh, yeah, I keep them in a camera bag because I have so many camera bags now. And then I have, uh, uh, I bought a box of these dehumidifying little packets that you always get when you buy stuff. You know, those little, uh, they look like little sugar packets that you're not supposed to eat. <laughs> so I bought I bought a bunch of those and I zip up my camera bag and I put some of those in the bag with the gear and then I try and keep it on the ground floor, not in the basement where there's less less humidity cuz humidity is really the main problem with long-term storage. Uh you have to keep humidity out. 
I mean, some people go as far as to wrap things in plastic and put a little, uh, one of those little packets in the plastic bag and store things long term. And that makes sense too, right? Uh, so you buy some Ziploc bags that you can put your gear into. You put a little, uh, those little dehumidifier packets inside with your camera and seal it. So, get, you know, that's that, that would be my advice there for long-term storage wow you guys have a bad storm up there made in the usa yeah we just got through some pretty heavy rain the other day last week i should say the panasonic g85 is under 700 dollar camera with a kit zoom okay statement of fact there i mean it's it's that, that was another camera that was on my short list back when I was shopping and I bought the EM10 Mark II. Uh, but they didn't have it on the shelf. <laughs> they only had the X-T10 and the EM10, and I ended up getting the EM10. Uh, Patrick's saying he still has all his Sony kit but wouldn't buy it again. Much prefer the M43. Yeah, you know, you know how I have a hard time selling stuff, uh, and I keep everything except for my Sony. I still have the Sony body and the kit lens, but I had two or three other lenses for it uh, that I sold because I'm never going to shoot with this camera again. And if I do, the kit lens is good enough if I do want to shoot with it. That's that's how I felt about my Sony. Like that was a camera I felt like I would never ever shoot again with. So I couldn't bring myself to sell the body itself with the kit lens, but I had no problem selling my 35 millimeter f uh, 1.8 or whatever it was, their prime, my 55 to 200, and I had uh, oh I think it was the 20 millimeter. I had a few lenses for it that I just got rid of. Uh, you know, my Nikon gear, I always feel like one day I'm going to take that out because I do have awesome lenses for it, and it's an awesome camera. And that's why I'm having a hard time selling it. And then obviously all my Olympus gear I'll, I'll never sell. Um, okay, Roman, we'll see you. Thanks, Thanks for coming in. Marcus Pix made a video yesterday asking if the Canon R5 is still relevant in 2020. The camera still hasn't come out yet. The message was all cameras can be great if you know what you're doing. I know. I, I don't know what... I don't know who watches these channels that review the latest gear and think that their photography, you know, I don't know. It's it it I, I try to think back when I was shopping for my first camera, and this was like I think in 2012 when I bought the Sony NEX. I went based and there wasn't there was some YouTube out there. It's not like it is today in 2020. But in 2012 a lot of the photography channels were about how to take pictures, right? How to how to expose properly, how to, you know, there was a lot of tutorials. And so I couldn't really use YouTube as a resource to help me buy a new camera. So I went online and, and read all the reviews. Like DP Review, I think, was, was there and Imaging Resource and whatever online forums and magazines were online. Uh... Now I can't remember why I'm talking about this. Oh, oh, the message, yeah. So, uh, 
my buying decision was based on all of the uh, features that were on the camera. And at the time, Sony was pretty feature rich and they were advertising that they had their Sony app, I forget what it's called, uh, My Memories or something, where you could download apps and add more functionality to the camera. So I was like, and I, you know, I'm kind of a nerd that way. So I was like, man, this, this camera is going to be future proof, right? Because I can start downloading apps for it. And the, uh, the image quality seems on par with everything else out there. And the, the reviews on it were really good. So I went with Sony NEX6 is what I bought back in 2012. In today's day and age, with all of the reviews and, and people doing stuff online, um, it, it's, it seems like it's nothing's, in terms of tech wise, not much has changed that much since 2012. That Sony NEX will still take decent images uh, up against my any other camera I own, really. Um, so I, and, and vice versa, any camera I own now is going to take as good a picture as that Sony did, if not better. Oh, anyway. Uh, I just ranted about nothing. I can't even remember what I was talking about. Photoscape X is excellent. I love Photoscape X. Okay, bye Siegfried. Silica crystal packs, thank you. That's what they're called. I've been calling them little sugar packs, but they're silica crystal packs. Oh, hi, Dadis. How are you? Rob, the confusing thing for me is what affects the RAW and what only affects the JPEG. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, I... I can't make a list of things, but I know digital tally converters one. Uh, the best thing to do, okay, is I thought is if you're not sure about a particular feature, what's what's JPEG, what's RAW, is set your camera to shoot RAW only, right? And then select the feature that you want to uh, use, and then see if you get a JPEG and a RAW file at the same time. So, for example. If if I set my camera to RAW only, and then I, I pick an art filter, the camera is going to create a RAW file that's going to be nothing but RAW data, and then it's going to create a JPEG with the art filter applied. So that is, that is a setting that affects, that has a different effect on the RAW file versus the JPEG. Digital teleconverter is another one. If you're shooting in RAW only, but you use a digital teleconverter, it's going to create two images, one RAW and one JPEG, and the JPEG is going to be cropped. So that, that's the best way. Set your camera to RAW only, and then start to get a feel for or experiment for very specific features that you want to use, and then look at your memory card and see what files were created. And if you have your camera set to RAW only, but then you see a JPEG file next to it, then you know that that feature is a JPEG centric feature. The only thing that affects a raw file in your camera is your ISO setting. So if you change the ISO, you're, you know, higher, you're going to get noisier images, just like, you know, in any kind of camera. But everything else uh, does not affect your raw file. You, you know, RGB versus Adobe RGB, your art filters, taking pictures in monochrome, uh, distortion correction, like the, 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 the skewing, you know, fisheye correction, whatever. Everything else in the camera does not affect your RAW files, but it will affect the JPEG files. So anyhow, hope that, hope that helps. <laughs> um, Patrick saying, still got the Sony lenses you listed. Can't bring myself to sell them, even though I can't remember the last time I used them. I know, right? They were good at the time, but I just, yeah, you and I were in the same page then, back then. Uh, we looked at DP Review, we looked at, uh, I didn't go to the forums too, I went to the forums too, come to think of it. And yeah, to adapt lenses, I got adapters for Minolta and Nikon and, and OM and uh, 
even some screw mount adapters. Yeah, I used to adapt like crazy on my Sony. That was the other reason I bought it too. Yeah. My God, you guys are, me and you are like twins back in 2012. Yeah, Amazon now owns Deep Review. Yes, I've heard that. Um, I miss camera curves, remember? I don't know what you mean by camera curves, Elaine. Silica gel needs to be charged in the microwave when the color changes. Yeah, some yeah, some silica packs have this they sprinkle them with uh like uh they they change color. Sometimes they have they only put a few in there that change color, sometimes the entire pack, everything in there changes color when they're uh all used up and then you can I heard not microwave. I heard put them in a toaster oven at a certain temperature over time. But maybe microwave works uh, to to recharge them. You know, unfortunately, the silica gel packs that I bought do not change color. So you need to look for that specific uh, type of silica pack that will change color when they're exhausted. But they're rechargeable, fortunately. Why is the Olympus MJ so popular all of a sudden? I traveled to Europe with mine back in 95, still got it. I have no idea. I mean, I guess film has sort of this been, been coming back the last couple of years. I guess, I guess you were here when when you saw I, I bought this brand new in the box for $6 at a, at a whatchamacallit, uh, antique sale. I just can't believe it. And this thing is going for like 300 bucks on eBay. I, I'm I'm like I'm scared to use it now because it's it's because it's worth so much. But I want to use it because it's a nice little camera. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, Mike uh, said the the he had a few Sony's and he he didn't like it. Wow. So the M5 Mark III with the 75-300 is still better than the RX-10 Mark IV with the 24-600. And the Sony still sells for $2,200 here in Canada. I think the RX-10 is a one-inch sensor, though. So the 24-600 is really not that focal length. Um, hence, and, and the pixel density, you know, is really tight. There's so many things about a camera that affect image quality. You know, you can't just look at the, the bottom line, the specs, right? 10 megapixels, 20 megapixels. Um, Yeah, that video you did remind me of the MJ. It was so easy and compact ahead of its time for point and shoot. Rob, I have relatives in New York State that I visit from time to time. Are you close to them? No. New York is about five, six hours solid drive. I think it's about five hours to the state line. And then once I get there, so sorry. You know, but if anybody's ever in the DC area, you know. Like Digital Grandpa, we went for a photo walk. I'm happy to go out. I always love going out for a photo walk. Uh, John Allen says, avoid the microwave to dry. Put them in a radiator. Yeah, that's what I, that, that's the way I was, I was told to dry them out was in a toaster oven. Uh, yes, I know, Rick, but I would rather trust users rather than YouTubers that are being bribed by expensive trips. Yeah, I know. Like I said, these these reviews are always they're all sponsored. You know, it just bothers me when they say they're not paying me to do this review. But okay, not specifically, but yeah, they paid for your trip to wherever. They sponsored all of the expenses. That's effectively the same thing. 
And even if you try to be honest, you know, subconsciously you have some goodwill with that manufacturer, you would think. Anyhow, I don't, I don't want to rant on that. <laughs> Back in the day with Nikon, you could adjust your settings to how you like them to look like a movie, for example, and people would share them on the net for you to download. Really? They were called camera curves. I never heard of that. That's a little before my time. Far too many of those user reviews are fraud. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I think fraud is a little bit of a strong word. I would say the influ influencers are being influenced is more accurate. And they will try to be honest. Uh, I think they do try to be honest, but if you look at my channel and Peter's channel, Peter Forsgaard and Robin Wong, you rarely see gear reviews, right, from third parties. Um, I mean, time to time, sure, but it's not like every week there's a freaking review on some gear or talking about some gear in the news or... You know, at least like camera conspiracies, he's doing it as entertainment. He's not trying to influence your decision. He's just being, you know, he's just making fun, right? Uh, but man, I, it just, uh, it, 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 it shouldn't bother me, but it bothers me now when something new comes out and then my YouTube channel feed is flooded with uh, X1, you know, like the Fujifilm X100V just came out. And I've got about 20, you know, 20 icons or 20 thumbnails of reviews and firsthand and firsthand looks and, you know, unboxings of the Fujifilm X100V. And I'm like, why are you cluttering my page with this crap? I just, so I'll watch one. I watched one from Chris and Jordan. I like, I like, I like their reviews, but, uh. Anyhow, or they review things like price and delivery times rather than the experience of ownership. Yeah. In one of your videos, Andrew's saying, in one of your videos, you mentioned that using the 75 to 300 on the M1 Mark II turned the lens into a different lens. Oh, it just, the, the focusing part of that, it, it just felt faster. You know, I could hear, you know, like when I put the lens on, say, the EM10 Mark II, the, the focusing just didn't, wasn't so snappy, you know, uh, because it was always hunting and it didn't lock focus more than half the time. But when I put it on the uh, EM1 Mark II, man, that thing was just, you could hear that motor working at its, at the fastest it could. So the EM10 Mark II didn't push that lens to its limits, whereas the the EM1 Mark II was definitely pushing that lens to its limits uh, and getting the most out of it. So that's 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 kind of what I meant. I, f I feel like the EM10 Mark II didn't push that lens near its limits or get the most out of it. Rick says, check out my verified reviews on products. I bought elsewhere. Not sure what you mean there. What determines how much data there is in a raw file when you take a photo? Uh, basically, how much light there is, Robert. I mean, if there's plenty of light, there's lots of data. Um, there's also, you know, does it capture in 12-bit or 14-bit, but 12-bit is capturing 99.9% .9 of what matters in an image. So there's there's 14-bit capture cameras that capture that extra tiny bit in the shadow areas. Uh, but it's essentially light. Having good light determines how much you capture and texture, right, or differences in light. 
Hi, Rob. It's like the angles, angels are singing when rumors say we shall see ISO 100 at base ISO. But sad to know the EVF and display seems to remain like the MK2. It's possible. I, I thought the rumor was the EM1 Mark III is going to have the EM5 Mark III EVF. I mean, I haven't seen anything on the EM1 Mark III that's a deal breaker yet, right? Um, everything leaked so far, if you can believe them, uh, camera seems fine. I'm just curious what the new processor is going to bring to it if the focusing is better. Uh, because, like I said, until they come out with some new sensor, and I mean radically new, like you can shoot at ISO 100,000 and still get tack sharp images with no noise, right? Uh, they're they're going to have to to think of other ways to innovate, so improve the autofocusing. But I I don't know. We'll see when it comes out. We'll we'll make our decision then, or have some feedback then. But I, it's hard for me to comment on something I don't have in my hands. Uh, okay, Juan, well, see you later. Yuhan. Uh, Oh, fraudulent verified purchase reviews. Okay, so that's what you mean, Rick. All right, I understand that. Yeah. That's true. That's true because, you know, people misunderstand when they send you a product for free. Um you're getting paid to do that review. Whereas, you know, like among friends, you know, it's like, oh, you can, you can, you can have this camera. I, I don't know a good analogy for that, but yeah, getting free product is the same thing as getting paid. Thanks, Rob, for answering my question. I know that I can simplify my setup and not worry about all these options. P.S. Does white balance and exposure affect RAW? Uh, white balance does not. Um, exposure does in, with respect to ISO, aperture, shutter speed, right? Those are, those are going to affect your image in, in, in a way that exposure would. Those, those are the core things of photography, but ISO in particular is the one that will affect the raw image the most relative to shutter speed and exposure or just what you do, but ISO will affect the image. The fun with Olympus use for birding is when you can laugh at the guys who carry 40 pounds of stuff. I know. I mean, I, I, you know, I'll catch glimpses of videos where people switched from full frame cameras to the EM1X with a 300 millimeter F4 Pro and how much more uh, uh, agile they are and comfortable and still getting great images. You know, they, they have no complaints. They said sometimes they have to do a hair bit more uh, post-processing for noise uh, on some images. Uh, but, you know, the trade-off for being able to get the shot to begin with is worth it. Following up in the Lightroom versus Luminar question, one of the advantages I'm interested in is the lens profiles in Lightroom. Oh, yeah, for Micro Four Thirds, you don't need to worry about it. And I think, and, and probably for a lot of cameras now, uh, if you're using a native lens, micro, native Micro Four Thirds lens that has all the electrical contacts, lens profiles don't exist in Lightroom either because the profile is built in to the camera's processor, which, let me, let me, it reminds me, I need to go back to the other question about what else affects your raw image. Um, 
lens profiles are built into the camera before it records the raw image as well. So if you're using a micro four thirds lens, that will affect your raw image uh, in a positive way. It corrects for the um, any lens perspective issues, lens profile issues like flaring, purple flaring, not purple flaring, but like chromatic aberration, vignetting, uh, things like that are corrected before the raw file is written if you have a native lens. And that's the same thing true for Lightroom is most of those lens imperfections are corrected in camera. So Lightroom doesn't have any lens profiles, say, for the 17 millimeter f1.8 uh, because they know that Olympus is already corrected for everything that Lightroom would do. That's not to say you can't do more corrections manually, uh, but... There's no lens profiles in Lightroom. They do exist. Now, they do have lens profiles for non-micro four-thirds lenses. So if you're adapting lenses, it's very handy to have those. Uh, I use one all the time. I use a Sigma lens profile for my fisheye lens to do perspective correction in my real estate work. Just to give you one example. So in that sense, yeah, the lens profiles are very handy if you're using third-party lenses, <clears throat> uh, because my fisheye lens, I can do correction in, in Olympus Workspace perspective or distortion correction, but I can't do it in Lightroom. Um, and I need to use Lightroom and Photoshop for my pro work. Some re Lauren's saying some reviews on items are hilarious. Great entertainment. Yeah. Like I said, Camera Conspiracies, he's, he's purely entertainment channel. and it, it, So it doesn't matter to me what he says about uh, any camera, but I love watching him, you know. And the same thing with Chris and Jordan. I, I, they, they've kind of gone a little bit more on the entertainment side. <clears throat> they've always tried to be entertaining, I think, since they've ever started doing videos. But they, they seem to be actually, you know, leaning towards that more so than ever. Uh, EM1 Mark II and a 300 Pro lens, how much do you need? Yeah. Uh, do you still have any pictures? Oh, I'm sorry, that's not for me. I'm doing a 15-kilometer hike across the dunes with a 5-kilogram cannon gear on my bag. Those days are gone. Oh, you remember doing, doing that. Wow. I know, I, I bought one of these... 24 or 40 liter backpacks to carry all of my Nikon gear. And I would hike up this mountain. It was a small mountain. But it still, it was, uh, I think it was only about, it was only like a five kilometers, right? But it was almost straight up. I mean, the elevation went really fast. God, I just... I used to be able to do that like six years ago, but man, I can't even walk up there with no gear <laughs> anymore. I'm so out of shape. I, I got to get back in shape. Uh, oh, you're welcome, Datus. Hi, Datus. Rob, have you thought of an air purifier for your bedroom to help with your allergies? Um... Yes, I have a few air purifiers. I haven't used them recently. Um, but thanks for reminding me. I don't know why I'm not using them. <laughs> I ha I have a I have a couple of them. I I you know the. We'll see if that helps. I think I stopped using them so I could save some electricity. Like I said, I, you know, being a full-time photographer and YouTuber, it's full-time, but the money's part-time. 
<laughs> so uh, I think that's why I stopped using them. <laughs> it's so silly because I calculated it one day and the the uh the air purifier costs like only about two dollars a month to run but i was thinking man if i turn that one off and i stop using that light i'll save about four dollars and now my electrical will be four dollars less that's about 50 bucks a year that's pretty substantial <laughs> just the way i think sometimes and then I'll, I'll go buy a $1,200 camera. I guess, anyway, we're all lunatics, right? In, in real life, we're all lunatics and hypocrites. Uh, Casey from Camera Conspiracy is mostly tongue-in-cheek. As long as you realize that you don't take his comments to heart, you'll get a great laugh. I know. I know. Casey's great. Casey is great. Once in a while, he'll bring up a legitimate question, though, right, that I'll think about. Like, he was saying the Fuji had better auto exposure in video than the, the Olympus, which I still haven't thoroughly tested yet, but I did do a, sort of a mini test, and I, I didn't see it. I didn't see what, what problem. I didn't get the same problem he was having. Okay, Lauren, thanks. Thanks for coming in. Yeah, I, I've been watching, Elaine, you know, I've been watching his uh, Vegetable Police channel for a long, long time. Uh, and that's how I found him initially was, uh, was through his health channel. It's just like that guy, Angry Photographer, right? Uh, I used to search for physics. Uh, I had some questions about physics and magnetics. And I found his channel when I was searching for videos on uh, magnetism. And then it turned out he was a photographer too, which I thought was weird. But back, you know, six years ago or so or whatever, he wasn't doing a lot of photography videos. He was doing mostly, <clears throat> well, let me, I don't know. I found him through physics. And Casey, I found through, I was looking for some some sort of uh, health information. And then I see this guy wearing a blonde wig, and I was like, well, okay, you know, I need a good laugh, right? So I started watching it. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're Canadian too, huh, Andrew? Yeah. It's the cold weather, man. Your brains are frozen. <laughs> cold weather, I tell you. Oh, okay, well... I started a little bit earlier today because I have to end a little bit earlier. I want to end by 12 o'clock. Um, so I'll stay on for about five more minutes. So if anybody has any other questions or final thoughts. Uh, no, you're male like me. I like toys, not paying utility bills. I know, right? But I don't think the air purifier is, I think the air purifier is justified as you said it affects you taking photos. Oh, hey Rick, what did you think about uh, Capture One? Did you ever, did you ever um, try that software out or is it, because uh, I remember last week I think you were talking about uh, Capture One. Speaking of electricity, I need to turn the space heater back on. Man, it, it's like my house is so old, it has a lot of drafts, so it gets cold quick. <laughs> okay, Andrew, good. I'll look for your questions there. I, I check. I try to check it every day, every morning. Okay, John, we'll see you later. Thanks for coming in. Okay, so you're still looking at it.
All right. Um, okay. Wow. That was, that was fun guys. I think I need to head out. Um, but again, thanks for everybody coming in. I'll be back here on Thursday. And then remember that in two weeks, uh, February 20th, I think it is, we're going to do the, uh, uh, live stream collab with Maddie Salantu and Emily from Micro Four Nerds. And I'm trying to get one more guy in, but I haven't heard back yet. But if it's, if it's those two, that's great. Those are the main people I wanted to get in anyway. And, uh, oh, Kate, Catalan has a question. I wrote you on Instagram about my M2 died on me. Oh, yeah, sorry. I meant to reply to you. No. I, I've never had that problem. And you said you kept it, I remember you said you kept it like dry for five hours or you brought it back to room temperature for five hours and you're getting that error. And I was looking at it on my phone, but I I didn't have my glasses on, so I couldn't see what the message was you were getting on your on your camera. Uh I meant to get back to it, but yeah, I long story short, yeah, I have no idea. I've never gotten that error. Uh Okay, bye Plato, bye Elaine, bye Andrew, let's see, hi Rob, I enjoy your videos and live chat, thank you, okay, I bought the 12 to 40 f2.8 lens used re recently, I noticed a couple of small nicks in the front glass, not really, you're not gonna, I, I nicked the front of my glass, of my 12 to 40, if, if there's a tiny nick on the front of the element, it's not a big deal. It's when you get nicks on the back element that it's a problem. That's going to affect your image a lot more than this. Because think about it. If I take a picture, I can put my finger in front of the lens, right, like this. How much does it really affect the image? Not a whole lot. Uh, not as much as you would think. Um, so a tiny, tiny nick on the front of the lens is not going to make any difference. So don't worry about it. Guy, get in another girl. <laughs> that would be nice if, if I knew any. All right. Bye, Lane. Bye, Andrew. You guys have a good uh, week, and we'll see you on Thursday.